imagine we have like a ball of yarn and we're going to start by throwing this ball of yarn to you, the public, and would like to start by inviting one of you that has a uh, burning, relevant, significant, or any kind of question that you would really like to hear an answer to in terms of redesigning universities and just post the question to one of us, uh, Gael, myself, or Natalia, uh, and when human uh, comes, also human. So you have to choose a question and choose a person. So pose a question to the person. We will answer the question as best we see. And then whoever is chosen to answer the question will, at uh, the end of the answer, think of a question that connects the answer just given to a curiosity that we have on redesigning universities. And then we will throw this ball of yarn to another of the panelists with this question, which is completely a surprise question. And that second panelist will answer the question. And then at the end, again, pose a new question to another panelist that connects the answer just made with an inner curiosity and so on and so forth. We'll go through the four of us panelists and the last panelist to answer a question will then throw the ball of yarn back to you, the public, uh, and just pose a question that any one of you can answer. Uh, when one of you answers that question, then we will go on with the game with somebody else in the public, that person asking a question to somebody else in the public, and that's the way we're gonna be weaving between us like this ball of yarn going around uh, through questions that are just emerging from the conversation that are connecting what we are saying instead of just having presentations that are disconnected between them. So I'll be facilitating a little bit uh, through, throughout the game. And as another feature of the game, we have Ha Nariman as a trickster. So don't think she dresses like that every day. She is dressed as a trickster. And the role of the trickster is to make explicit things that are invisible, just uh, interrupting and uh, bringing the critical uh, view in a playful way to challenge whatever it is that we are saying. So the idea is that we incorporate not only the ball of yarn that is going around weaving the questions, but also uh, in any way we see fit and fun and useful or nothing of the above, uh, whatever Nariman is doing, which we would have, we have no idea what that will be. So this is, this is the game and let's start. So again, the idea is that we connect the uh, and answers with questions. That's, that's, that's a weaving game. So the way this game starts is with one of you posing one question to either myself, Natalia, or uh, Gael, any question that you would like to have an answer to in terms of... <laughs> so, ball of yarn has been thrown. Who wants to catch it? Uh, did I get right that we can ask questions? Yes. Yes. Just ask one question and choose who you want that question to be answered by. Yeah, maybe to Natalia. How do we bring enchantment into universities? Enchantment of learning, researching. Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. Thank you. <laughs> That's very exciting. Um, enchantment. Uh, good question, because probably that's one of the main problems with universities, that the enchantment around learning and the world is kind of learned out of us. Uh, because to a certain degree, we are, this is my view, obviously, to a certain degree, we are expected to break the world up into objective pieces that we can then kind of assimilate and learn about. Um, how do we bring it back? I believe that we 
that in order to redesign universities, what we'd like, what we'd need to do is uh, bring enchantment and all back, all enchantment about the learning process, so that learning is in a certain way uh, sacred, because learning is what kind of evolves us as humans constantly within our lives as a species. Um, we do it continuously every minute of our life, yet when we do it in university, it is again broken down to something very rudimentary and uh, not, 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 not always necessarily very exciting. So it, I guess it would be about, um, yeah, bringing in processes in which people can be in awe with what's an, around them, um, in awe with uh, how they learn, in awe with other people, uh, enchantment in the learning processes themselves, how they are, how they are uh, presented, what people do together. And, and that probably doesn't mean, probably means that we're not necessarily relying on textbook, but coming back into the real world and being enchanted by what's around us in the real world rather than translated, again, in objective ways in, in textbooks. So that is my warm up into this panel. Um, I hope that answers it slightly. Okay, right. Um, yeah, actually, I'd like, if we are going with this thread, I might just pose the same question to somebody else in the panel. Um, maybe Victoria, how do you particularly bring enchantment in your own university? And what does that mean? If you, if you are the first one um, that is doing that, how do you allow that process to happen in relation to a world where that might not be that common? Hmm. Well, it was again tonight, forcing laughter, faking smiles, same old tired, lonely place. Definitely That's singing. I saw your face. Hmm. So I think playing is a very important part of it. Uh, bringing playing back to to the to the learning process, and uh, one specific uh, way that we do it is that we start since we're we're a project uh, based uh, uh, we have a project based learning process, and we always start our programs, master degrees or or bachelor's degrees with the first project is how can you regenerate your own personal enthusiasm? Uh, which is, uh, to begin with, loads of fun if you're, you know, coming to a, a university to study architecture or law or uh, public policy, and then the first, pro and you know it's a project-based process, and then the first project that you have is this challenge of regenerating your personal enthusiasm and actually researching, doing action research around what does that mean to you? So if you want to regenerate the world, which is what our university uh, calls for, uh, people that are interested in, in um, transforming systems, social environmental systems, well, we start with, well, how could you actually change your own world, your own personal work? Can you start with that, with working with, a, with the smallest system possible, which is yourself, and then, uh, um, working with bigger systems. So that first thing, which has to do with uh, the, also exploring this idea of what does regeneration mean? Uh, not so much conceptually, but what if you go and research that in your own terms and try to choose an activity that you think is uh, an activity that um, produces enthusiasm and what does that mean? You know, enthusiasm and theos means being between the gods. Uh, what is it that you do in your life that is uh, a fountain of enthusiasm in that sense? And how can you make it more beautiful, uh, you know, more powerful in terms of the enthusiasm it produces? So this is, a, this is the game. This is the challenge, just making that activity more powerful in terms of, the, of its enthusiasm. But then the game... Uh, 
post us a game, you know, go out there and just do it. And then uh, every three weeks, we form small groups of, of uh, participants that start sharing what they're finding out and what they're doing. And we combine the game with this, you know, seeming a, a formal, being a formal um, research, you know, in terms of what's your hypothesis, uh, why are you doing this? What is it that you're doing? How, are, how do you know uh, uh, that this is uh, producing more enthusiasm, et cetera? And um, it's super interesting, you know, what happens in terms of having uh, a, a group of battles or young uh, people uh, trying to figure out what, how can they regenerate their own enthusiasm in, the, in their lives. And uh, what is really magical about this process is what starts happening in terms of the learning community. Uh, sharing uh, the way that they are learning and the challenges are they, they, they are they are facing, and also the surprises, the big surprises. And uh, there's always the the trickster role, no, in terms of of really uh, making the, the the questions that uh, sometimes need to be posed for for uh, us to really get into a project like that. So that's one uh, very specific uh, answer, you know, in terms of one process. Uh, that we've discovered that brings enchantment back. And this is why we start with this. So it's ones that, ones that you have um, gone through trying to regenerate your world and you have um, done it through and you know, trying to figure out what enthusiasm is. The idea is, can you, how can you hold to this enthusiasm throughout the learning process? How can you make the learning process also part of uh, a fountain of enthusiasm, and this is a question that we hold all the time. So that's that's a a, a very uh, specific example of a of a process. And with that, I would like to throw the ball of yarn to Gael. And I'd like to know, Gael, uh, since uh, uh, you you uh, say you work with. Uh, you know, systems uh, perspective, uh, how in your own um, university uh, redesigning process, are you connecting personal transformation or regeneration with social and environmental uh, regeneration? <laughs> Well, uh, thanks very much, Victoria, for that very simple question. Um, like it, uh, I like the I like the question of the enchantment as well, um, very much so. Um, um, so, 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 what you're what you're asking is 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 actually part of the answer to the first question, which is uh, how do we how do we get a structure where an institution where when you go to learn, you learn something which is useful for yourself, for the others, and for the planet. And so how you get this constant alignment, or at least you try to get uh, that constant alignment, because that's that's where you will have uh, the less uh, problems in, in deciphering what is good for you. Um, so one of the things that we are doing uh, in that respect, uh, and then I, maybe I can discuss a more systemic way to try to address the problem, is um, one of the things that we are doing in practice is that we had a student, a master's student. That was, so what, one of the things that we do is that we, we ask our students what they want to learn and we co-construct what they learn with themselves. So that that's that part of the of the reason why uh, they keep some of them keep being enchanted is because they are learning things that are valuable for them and so one of them uh, who was a philosopher originally was really interested into how do you find your raison d'être and so he deep dive into this and then he came up with all kind of very interesting literature and and practices around what you, most of you may know as the ikigai you know that that very simple concept coming from the from japan originally but that has been somehow that became viral because of a, a consultant in in the in uh, in california that drew that uh, four circles where you your raison d'etre uh, your is at the intersection of what you know what to do what you love what to do what the world needs and where you can get resources from and and so he was really interested in this so he has developed all kind of workshops uh, to help students uh, find what matters most for them 
that is what is that that ikigai spot uh, and and it's not something which is you do it once uh, and and it's forever it's a it's a dynamic process it's it helps you being reflexive on what is it that you want to learn and what is it that matters to you and and what are you good at and and where you will contribute the most uh, and so knowing uh, so so it helped us to redesign as well our program so that now um you know our programs the students they learn about the big challenges that the world is facing so that it, they are presented with what the world needs in a way they have uh, a reflexive and ikigai sessions to work on what is it that they would like to do and who they are and what what are they, and then the rest is about methodology to give them equip them with what they need to pursue their quest their own quest and by almost by definition that is aligning what is important for them with what is important for the community and somehow and sometimes for the planet uh, and you know you you try to you you never learn as 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 you never learn as efficiently as um, if you're the, um, la, 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 another one to say <laughs> the other way to say it is the the most efficient way to learn something is that if you do something which really matters truly for you, right? And so that's that's the that, that's the deepest uh, thing because uh, even the bacteria are doing it. So uh, we, it's not invented very recently. So now, if if we zoom out, you know, what one thing which is really striking is that universities are very good at doing research and they do research on absolutely every potential topics, even topics that you don't understand any of the words that are in the sentence, uh, nor I do, nor either do we do. They are not doing anything on the future of university, nor what the university is doing. There's just no R&D for university. So those very important questions uh, had, um, are actually not asked or not studied, not structured. So we have to ask ourselves what would be uh, the good way to um, uh, to do this but we, it could be a system right we could share practices around this we could test it we could ask the students whether that works we could ask the community whether that works we could do science science is just a way to capitalize knowledge and test it to make sure it is as efficient as possible and we just don't do it so my uh, my my check on this is that what we do need is to put this to test and explore and and allow all the teachers and and uh, and 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 the, uh, the the people that are working in universities to unleash their potential to actually reconnect with themselves about what they want to learn and how they want to teach so that they can empower the students and do research on the best way to do it that would that, i mean that's really frustrating for me that uh, this is just not uh, put on, on a large scale and uh, on this uh, note which is a bit systemic um I would like to uh, invite our next speaker to uh, a very interesting question, uh, which is because enchantment is the key word of the day, what would be the other key word of the day that university should learn how to do? You know what, I'm bored. I'm actually really bored. You guys are not entertaining me. I should be, I should be somewhere where I'm entertained. Oh my God. I'm like really, really bored. How do I, how do I entertain myself here, huh? Please, some more entertainment, some more enchantment. Uh, can I ask a question? How do I get entertained? Yeah, I think that's 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 an interesting problem happening in, in 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 universities. You know, like participants feeling that they are there to be entertained. Uh, that it's not about their their questions. Uh, so you, you're right, Nariman. So, what would you like to be entertained with, Nariman? What is what is it that entertains you and that is good for the world at the same time? So if anyone in the public would like to catch either that question or Gael's question, catch the ball of yarn, answer, and then make a question back to uh, any other person in the public, please. So Gael's question, yeah, please. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not going to attempt to uh, answer uh, Nariman's question because that's long and convoluted. <laughs> um, but uh, I like the yeah the enchantment theme that has emerged, and I'm real curious about yeah. So what are the other key words? And uh, so the first one that came to my mind was, um, and it's it, it's it's about measurement. You know, uh, this is the the obsession of the university to measure and and compare and. So it's, it's, you know, how do we oppose that? How do we modify that in a way that's more authentic and enchanting for students? So I'm answering your question with a question and I throw the ball of yarn to anyone. Peter, would you like to answer that? So I decided to become a joker um, and join in this notion of craziness and enchantment. Um, so I, I pose in the chat the, the question that I work a lot with wisdom. Is wisdom a key word? Uh, we aspire to, in some places, a love of wisdom by our, the virtue of our degree in philosophy. Uh, philosophy. So let me pose that question. Um, and let me say that I think it is. Uh, and I do intergenerational, experiential, place based learning to try to inspire re indigenization. So that's a statement about what I think about wisdom. Anybody else? What about wisdom as a word, please? would like to catch that that thread what about wisdom as a word and how do we measure it says Liz give me permission to talk about wisdom Just give me permission I think Dahlia has her hand up yeah, I think uh, wisdom is a very interesting uh, concept because I, I work in Egypt and I have taught in three universities. And, and I think what I sense throughout the past 20 years or so, I worked in India as well, that at least in Egypt, the, the, the term wisdom is usually falls on uh, students and even colleagues as a, a tradition. And many uh, in this part of or this region of the world take wisdom as something that you are uh, taking them back away from science, away from modernity. Uh, and um, it's a kind of a self-colonial uh, like way of existence or worldview that I don't need to go back to my own wisdom. Yeah, I do respect it, but not in a university where I should be uh, uh, taught modern sciences or their newest versions. So wisdom is absolutely amazing if we try to blend it. Like um, in my courses, I try as much, I, I give uh, in, uh, anthropology and public uh, policy, and I try as much to question from where do we form what we know? How do we know what we know? And uh, I bring in common sense, common nonsense, traditions, uh, religions, whatever. But eventually, I see a lot of uh, resistance and uh, outright objection. No, I am not here to know what I can learn outside of the university. So wisdom is a bit contentious if taken out of, of cultural context and historical like moment. So um, that's what I can say. I mean, the question is, how do we uh, make the universities, uh, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, uh, like um, more of an, um, we work on inter interdisciplinarity, but also beyond the modern disciplines. 
So how can we create these kinds of interstices or spaces between not just modern disciplines, but also beyond disciplines into what was left out in the process of modernization? And I, uh, you choose uh, who takes the, the ball. <laughs> I'll give a, can I give a very quick answer to that? Um, I think the, the only answer to that question is that we need to completely break down the notion of universities because the university automatically implies that there is a certain kind of knowledge that deserves a building and a pedestal and um, peer review systems um, and all, all of the more knowledge which might be more wise, that doesn't fit within that building or that set of conventions, therefore automatically falls out of the concept of university. So it kind of takes us back to the whole topic of this panel. Um, how do we completely reimagine them? And so that would be my question to let's go with Gael. Um, what does that mean, reimagining universities for you? And you are still in a university. How is that? Is that a, do you feel that that's a paradox with what you would like universities to be? You're in and out of the system, you see, it seems. Uh, thanks, Natalia. Yeah, yeah, uh, we are definitely in and out. Uh, I mean, we are out and we help them to, to transform. So that's, uh, we can do whatever we want and then they take what, what fits in their system. So there, there are certainly, I mean, universities, but there are very different universities, right? So there's as many universities as you have. Uh, but I agree with you that uh, there is a, a common structure that relies on, on different things. And um, I, I, would, I would tend to disagree with your statement that uh, we should throw everything uh, uh, in the bus uh, uh, and then uh, reinvent everything. And that's, I mean, I, in history, I've never seen that before. Uh, this never happens. You don't reinvent everything from scratch. You reinvent with the blocks that already exist and you reconstruct something which really looks like, uh, and sometimes even, which is even worse than what was before uh, sometimes. So uh, I think we are, what is, uh, what, what strikes me is that for uh, the last 20 years, we had uh, the first time in history, uh, uh, a tremendous new way to communicate information and knowledge, and that has profoundly changed the way we teach. Uh, and that, I mean, university before, that's a very, you have a very simple reason why it's structured this way. You need to have some scholars, uh, you need to approach them, you need to get some books. And so the physical uh, uh, distance, etc., means that it's concentrated in places with the internet that explode. And so now you can get the knowledge everywhere. And so that also, you know, change everything related to discipline. You, you have the transdisciplinarity where you can build stuff with things which are supposedly not disciplinary, etc. So this is a moving, moving sense. Uh, and and for, the, for the right, for, I mean, this is a moving field for the right, uh, for, for a better world, uh, I guess, and for a better flexibility and freedom to to learn and teach but um even if you if i mean i cannot imagine something where it would be totally totally different uh in a sense that even if we get a full up fully read of everything that, that exists you will need to find as a person that wants to learn what are the best sources to learn what you want to learn Right and the best person, uh, right? Who are the good the good mentors? Who are the person that have the experience, or who have the person that have better digested that knowledge and understood that knowledge so that it can help you grow faster? Because if we go back to an age where you have to do your trial and error all the time for everyone then it's the darkest and most chaotic age ever I can imagine, right? Because you just don't use what is the most important uh, feature of our species is that we are an extraordinary social species and we learn from one another. That's the difference between uh, us and most of the uh, other uh, organisms. So I, I agree with you that we have to reimagine in a long way a lot of things, but I would I would love to see... Uh, if we can create buckets between what needs to be, you know, improved, what should be stopped, uh, what we should do differently. And, 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 and in that way, and I also not a very good fan of, you know, let's destroy everything and something else will flourish. This in history, this is again, the recipe for chaos. So how do we provide 
the, uh, the 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 incentives and the help and and the compassion to find all those people that are in prison in those universities so that they can find a way out in a much better model so therefore they would also push in the same direction i think that's for me that's that's an interesting question that i would like to throw to anyone that is interested in this topic I'll pick up the ball. <laughs> um, so I feel like chaos, if you look up physics, is what everything is made of, what everything is made up of. So you can think of it as chaos and emptiness, or you can think about it as creation mode. So you're not destroying anything. You're just creating from all that is. And I think that the confusion comes in when we believe that a university is, you know, like a union. And um, we want it to be like a pluriversity, you know, where pluriverses can coexist, but really um, it's about becoming. And so it's more like an innerversity. Um, and I think that from there, then we can step into wisdom, which is embodied knowledge that comes from all that is. I see lots of talking. I see lots of faces looking at screens, staring. I see lots of phones scrolling. I see lots of pedestals put on this room. And I want to be on the pedestal too. Oh. Give me the stage a bit. So I'm going to take the stage a bit. <laughs> and what, it, you know, it's interesting as I'm listening to this, because the reason I came into this is this idea of reimagining the university. And I've heard a couple things that might start weaving together. I heard the idea of wisdom, but I also heard the idea of entertainment, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I also hear that, you know, we, we have to reimagine or we destroy. But what I'm really wondering is the mindset that we have to understand how we need to evolve. Because if we are a living system, which systems are, where we're not mechanical, we're not mechanistic. So, so the question from the point of view of entertainment, I find interesting is I, I have had 16 years in university, but before that, I've had 39 years in the K-12 environment and all types of, uh, you know, roles, superintendent schools, all that stuff. And what I find interesting is, and at my age, the generational gap between maybe developing wisdom in the old medieval time because of some of the trappings that we do at my university where we have convocation and we all dress up in our regalia and we all walk down, which is kind of this, you know, reinforcing a medieval point of view of what university is about. But our kids want to be entertained because they come out of an environment which is based on entertainment, you know, social media, how do we do that? What can you deal? And now we're dealing with the idea of safe spaces and we're, we're concerned about how we talk. So I'm wondering really, as we think about this and the other aspect, and I know in our university is the economics of the university are beginning to play in because we have decreasing enrollments, which is putting pressure on the university to survive. We talk about transdisciplinary approaches to redesign who we are as a university. So, so I'm just throwing out there is that maybe in terms of our thinking, we need to evolve with the rest of the communities that we're based in. So I just wanna throw that out there.
wanting to be enchanted, but waiting for permission. Wait, please, let's talk. Please, let's redesign universities, but still raise our hands to talk and take permission. Okay, I, I would like to share something uh, on, <laughs> I'd like to share, uh, because I've uh, given workshop on transdisciplinary here in Asia, and and the transdisciplinary, the core of all the transdisciplinary uh, dynamic is based around, of course, technology, because uh, technology is a transdisciplinary uh, discipline. Uh, w whatever it touches, it can regenerate in in multitude of dynamic ways. But uh, another thing that is very unique here is uh, in here because I live in Bali is the trans transdisciplinary working with you know the quantum mechanic and energy and how and and how uh, in Bali they have an energetic calendar that. Uh, allow you to connect yourself into and, and here and and what I love about this indigenous culture of Bali is that uh, it's one of the oldest living culture. Like they were, they're still doing things in Bali that they did a thousand years ago, unchanged. The way they dress, the way they go to ceremony, uh, uh, and 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 so to look at an indigenous culture, a, a traditional culture. Uh, that is, has been unchanged based on this energetic calendar, which science is beginning to explain that there, there is no empty space. That there, there is information flying out there, just like Wi-Fi. There's other information, and the Balinese has recorded this information. And what it dawned to me in this conversation of being entertained, we need to be entertained, or you know, like you know, uh, uh, or we need toys as a child. Uh, uh, because we we are imposed with these conditions, we're imposed with these tools, we're imposed with these uh, uh, experiences. But why does a culture that has not changed for thousands of years in the middle of all international uh, 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 integration, it's because they follow this calendar. And in that calendar, it connects to this wisdom, this personal inner versity wisdom that keeps the, the the child or the person entertained. It keeps this dialogue with the divine or with nature uh, through this energetic counter. And if you can actually research this framework, then you would know that this energy feeds you, this energy entertain you, this energy um, uh, uh, develop your wisdom or or, or help you remember your wisdom uh and i think this is something that a lot of the university is is not connecting into from a transdisciplinary even though they speak of transdisciplinary they're, they're not talking about discipline that if you just that that sparks that that is like chemistry we don't know what happened and that it explode and and that could explode in the area of wisdom that could explode in the area of enchantment that could explode in the area of entertainment, you know, uh, self-gratification uh, in, in remembering who you are. So that's that's my input to what I've been hearing. And thank you for uh, not uh, reminding me that we don't need to raise our hand, that we can get engaged in this conversation. And it's just there's a lot of uh, academics here and, and, the, and the topic has gotten a bit heavy minded and and so people are less likely to engage thank you if it's okay and nobody else wants to go i i can't see the whole panel if someone else has raised their hand so forgive me but i wanted to follow up with um what hi die i don't know how to pronounce sorry forgive yes. me but so the thing that i think we have so the more we intimate with nature's forces and energies, the playground of ourselves as Gaia, wherever we are on the globe, there's a conceptual lens of something we learn in kindergarten called the circle. And that circle is a spiral, dynamic, bioluminescent form that both informs 
that embodied wisdom reforms the collective trauma from imperial colonial historical and then transforms our states of consciousness through i love this like toy play you know it's like a new quote unquote building block but it's not a block it's like a leaf or a twig or a mushroom so that we there's no separation from the whole brain whatever that is neurotransmitters to synaptic so so the signal from nature is firing but we haven't been learning how to receive that breath to receive the breath receive gaia's breath receive receive so the signal 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 from nature and we've been un we've been brainwashed to not receive unless unless it's preserved in places like bali and I have to tell you, I went to this Bora Badur in Indonesia. It's next to a volcano that could erupt. And yet there's this extraordinary temple, several of them, several, multi multiple religious experiences. And on nearly every other corner, there's a little temple. And so that what whatever we defined as sacred is like nature is intimate with nature is signaling, but we're not receiving it because of some modernization story. So the story of the circle reimagines and invites us back to our, not just our only our feminine divine. So the circle is a symbol of Hestia and Zizi in Asia and Ishtar. It, there's, there's this mother shape that will, it, it's like this, sorry, I, I, words are too, you know, it's like this, right? The Celtic. So it's in it's in the ether ethos of of um, nature. It's in nature. You know, it's already there. I don't know who. <laughs> we just need to be dance, interrupt, whatever. You know. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking. I'd love to jump in. Um, can you hear me? I have two devices on. Oh my gosh. So I wanted to, um, uh, receive Nariman's invitation to jump in without permission. And I'd love to, uh, do something playful and, um, courageous together. So. I invite you to close your eyes and to settle your feet on solid ground and take a deep breath. To soften, to breathe. And my invitation to you is to climb into my time machine. And off we go. <laughs> In an instant, we are climbing out and it's the year 2053. You are 30 years older and showing up right here in your local neighborhood. You wander out into the area. Ah, receive Gaia's breath. Honor the more than human and the human here. Notice what has changed. And what is just the same? You come across, as you wander about, you come across a learning landscape. What forms does it take? Are there buildings? Is there some kind of ecosystem of learning? What else? Who is there and how are they learning together? Are there teachers, facilitators, self-organizing swarms, mycelial networks, or what else? What feelings does it create in your whole body? Where do you feel it?
and choose a hopeful word or image about this learning landscape. And plant it in your heart. I need to call you back now. So we're going to head back to the time machine, wandering through your neighborhood and saying goodbye to the possibilities of what might lie ahead. Let's buckle up. <laughs> Welcome back to 2023. Look around you, feel your feet back on the ground, shake off the dust from the future. <laughs> and hold that image or feeling that you planted in your heart with you. So um, this is just a little example of some work that I've been trying to do at the University of Cape Town um, in a course co-created with students to reimagine or to imagine their futures, possible futures that might lie in front of them um, in the world and how they might engage in a completely changing, uncertain um, world in which we live and to, to reimagine the university space within which they are. Um, um, so it was, yeah, just to give you a little moment picture um, where we're trying to kind of redream into those spaces and then live evolving stories that they could create. Um, so I'd just sharing that into the space. I'd love to hear other examples of what people are doing um, or trying to do in the cracks of this monolithic colonial system that is so, so hard to, to shift. I'd like to pick up a little bit on, on that and uh, back to the idea of the circle and what Gael was saying in terms of us uh, humans learning together, being one of the very special features we come with. And for me, uh, I think one of the central ideas of redesigning universities has to do with how do we make universities real communities of practice? So instead of universities being a place where you just go and intellectually learn theories and things, um, how could we instead uh, learn by actually going and doing things and experimenting. So the university as a community of practice means that we uh, uh, different people are doing different things, but coming together to share. So instead of just learning from, for example, the, in the traditional model, just the teacher, uh, what if the universities were more uh, a ground for learning community, for us as humans to develop the ability of learning collaboratively. So it's not the same thing to be in a, in a classroom learning next to a person that really forming a learning community where you learn how to share things that are uh, learnable uh, uh, by others and how to learn from others and learn from others' experiences and the diversity that this implies. And now that Bridget uh, brought us to that imagination, I was, I was uh, seeing that, you know, for me, this dream of coming into a university and just seeing humans doing all sorts of explorations. But uh, uh, so it's not only, a, oh, let's have fun and let's get entertained, but there's things to be done and there's an evolution to be chosen. What is the cultural evolution that we can explore and choose together? So seeing uh, universities as a process of um, communities of practice for me represents this. Uh, and for me, this is one of the, of the central uh, uh, redesigns uh, that we need, uh, not theoretical spaces, 
but spaces of experimentation where we learn how to experiment because there are uh, methodologies for that. How do we experiment? And uh, looking for uh, uh, the transforming in, in, in beneficial uh, ways uh, what is surrounding us, but coming uh, uh, back and sharing the experiments and the learnings with others uh, and developing the abilities of, of collaborative learning, I think is, is one of the um, most beautiful potentials that we have in this moment in terms of redesigning uh, universities. So I would, uh, talk, we're on the time. Talk, talk, talk. To me, give it to me, give it to me, let me taste it, let me taste it, and start telling me about it, please let me taste it. Would it be useful for us to share a few of the visions that we had while Bridget guided us in this beautiful envisioning exercise? Would that be something appealing? to people because I, I think if we cannot yeah if like, it would be well if yeah if if would, appropriate if suitable because I think if we cannot imagine it yeah go for it no but maybe you would like to start because you you raised the question oh well I I am it's it's 30 years from now so I will be 91 years old so I played with that idea a little bit and I'm standing in a playground and I'm acknowledging the Mother Earth, but I'm also looking up and thinking of my next journey, which is another process of learning. So I just started playing with my own uh, living. So it's, it was deeply personal, but it was quite beautiful, actually, because for me, life is learning. I couldn't, at the moment, I'm really disheartened with my university. So I'm probably not in the best space to, but for me, learning is definitely outside of uh, confines of uh, neoliberal, um, discriminatory, uh, wing trimming university, but more in nature. I also had a vision of people sitting around fire and and talking and you know collaboration co-creation that kind of stuff so all these images came in my in my uh, fantasy but how about you um thank you for sharing i i also started with this you know um imagining myself 30 years on and actually my neighborhood doesn't exist anymore um i live in barcelona and the place was definitely flooded and um I, I, this, I was sitting with this notion of the, the learning landscape um, and what that can really mean, because I don't know, maybe somebody was there in, in the first Guti San uh, panel, uh, a film festival panel yesterday. I shared a little bit about living with um, a group of hunter foragers in Central Africa. So they have all these things apparently in brackets that we we miss um and that form of egalitarianism which is a socio-political economic cultural ecologic thing not just the the political version we have today has probably been around for at least thirty thousand years but probably much longer but it's 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 a model where you know we we made sure that nobody stood out and that's probably part of why we exist today and we can speak to each other here on zoom so with that for 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 many years now i've been sitting with this question of okay if this is where we come from and here we are now and i hear all these things about collaboration and and you know going back to nature and all this kind of stuff and if I think of my time with the BACA, that's how this group is called, then there is a certain development and they would, at least to a certain extent, want what we have in terms of material comforts and, and you know, making life easy. Because if you have to go to the tropical forests or be there every day in the sense that you really have to, you have to go out. It's not going out for a nice walk on Sunday afternoon. You have to make sure that you have food on your table. The fascinating thing was that, you know, sometimes being in, or often actually, 
enchantment, playfulness is more important than food, um, which destroys all the sort of academic theories around what hunter-gatherers used to do. Um, but just to say it's not this sort of nice, harmonious, easy living in community. Um, and that, you know, it really is this question of what we want to create for the future. And I wonder if the land is different and I wonder whether it is really our human capacity to listen what the land has to tell us and 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 take that and shape ourselves to be in a deeper conversation again um and how that can become part of of this global human community that we are um so yeah that's thank you <laughs> Yeah, I like what you said, um, and I, I, my thing that I'm wondering about is what does, you know, I keep hearing this word of interdisciplinary, and I, th I mean that's so. That comes from a very academic. Um, heteropatriarchal, westernized view. Um, and when you go back to the spiral um, and you look at interdisciplinary, like what does that mean? You know, um, when someone was talking about remembering you have to wonder like, what does that mean? Uh, we keep talking about humans, but um, what does interdisciplinary mean when we're not really looking at diversity? We're not re really acknowledging um, anything other than human. Hello everyone. So we know it's a beautiful conversation and uh, seems like a never ending possibilities of what can emerge, right? Uh, but we are out of time. <laughs> we are five minutes over time, actually, and it doesn't seem like it. Uh, but uh, we would like to just, uh, while we are closing then, we would like to really thank all the speakers who are here. And we would also like to, with a hand on our heart, uh, apologize. Uh, it's on us as Ecoversities that uh, we were expecting Dr. Human to be here. And we did send him an email, but it just went with the wrong timing for the panel. So he had it registered for an hour and a half later. That means that um, in another 25 minutes, he would ideally have actually locked in. And that is where uh, it was a mistake on our part. And we're extremely deeply sorry for this to have him, to have missed him on this beautiful panel because we know he would have added so much of amazing, valuable insights onto this. We do thank him extremely for his commitment to planning this panel with all the other panelists and being the person behind the trickster idea. We hope you can catch him and engage with his wisdom enchantment and playfulness during other spaces of this conference and beyond. He indeed brings them all to his classes. We are sure his mere presence would have added so many elements to this panel. So it is, you know, we are extremely sorry. It has been really confusing <laughs> and crazy across time zones. Uh, and we are hoping that we will get to witness his brilliance uh, in other platforms in the next couple of days over here. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming today and joining us here today, sharing your beautiful insights and inputs, your beautiful questions, uh, the amazing words, enchantment, wisdom, and so much more, right? And we will be sharing this recording with everybody. And you are welcome to share any inputs that you have with us uh, at a later stage as well. Thank you so much today.
And thank you to our beautiful trickster. Thank you everyone for playing the weaving game. <laughs> And thank you, Dr. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Natalia and Dr. Gail. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.